From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, a naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Free and Inspired Radio episode 20. Gosh, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in so far and all the positive comments. We've reached 20 episodes reasonably quickly and there's no sign of stopping. So let's get into it. Today, we're going to shift gears and talk about the most common blind spots in the Western diet by asking, is fiber the missing link to improving your health outcomes? Most likely, the answer to this question is actually yes. This is what we're going to be exploring in this episode. Nutritional research is often affected by region, and this deviation is down to the fact that different areas eat different foods. For example, we found in other episodes that diets in developed countries can have higher levels of zinc, for example, than in developing countries. And that kind of makes sense, right? But this isn't the case with fiber. and It seems almost ubiquitously low across all regions bar a few or consumption seems ubiquitously low across all regions maybe i just wanted to say ubiquitous again bar a few regions though and actually one of those regions that does have a good fiber intake is africa and this makes this episode more appropriate because it low fiber consumption affects a lot of people so wherever you're listening This is going to be an important subject if you're interested in your diet. Now, I find my prescriptions increasing dietary fiber equally as broad ranging when helping people. The recommendation is the same, whether for digestive symptoms such as constipation, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, weight management, blood sugar management, or even hormonal therapy. See what happens when you add another 10 grams of dietary fiber a day. But isn't fiber a carbohydrate and aren't carbohydrates bad well yes fiber is a carbohydrate and no carbohydrates aren't bad that's a different episode though dietary fiber consists of non-digestible forms of carbohydrates that generally originate in plant-based foods and in most cases the fiber isn't absorbed in the small intestine but instead utilized further down the digestive tract in the large intestine and the colon via bacteria and that fight the end products of that um, utilization are then put to use uh, in different ways and we're going to look at that over the course of this episode the reduction in plant-based food consumption across different diets such as whole grain foods vegetables fruits legumes and nuts has driven the exposure of this vital macronutrient down and in some places the shortfall is surprising and concerning Dietary fiber intake is on average 40 to 60% below the recommended daily targets. Let me say that again. Dietary fiber intake on average, depending on age group, of course, and region, 40 to 60% below the recommended daily targets, increasing your risk of major illnesses. These figures can generally be worse for children and older adults, And in the UK, estimates suggest that people are getting around 60% of their daily recommendations. The United States estimates are around 50%. And Hong Kong maybe even less with with average fruit and vegetable intakes around one to two units a day over both genders. So if you calculate that over to fiber, uh, I mean, the results uh, are very concerning considering how much fiber really does for the body. And we're going to look into that. A little bit of a history lesson here. Interestingly, the omnipresent conditions around the world match the places where fiber content is lacking. So the 
conditions that we see the most often are related to fiber and there's kind of a connection there now the history lesson comes in with the uh, thanks to someone called dennis burkett who when working in uganda noted that people between the ages of 40 to 60 years had a lower incidence of diseases that were common to similarly aged people in england these diseases included colon cancer diverticulitis appendicitis hernias, varicose veins, diabetes, asthma, and atherosclerosis. It's quite the list. And you can understand all of those conditions are common in most Western countries. All of these connections, these illnesses, sorry, are connected to lifestyles commonly led in high income countries. This connection became the origin of the Burkitt hypothesis, where Burkitt attributed the cause of these diseases to the low quantity of fiber consumed. This report was initially released by Burkitt or published by Burkitt back in 1969. So we've been talking about low fiber for a long time. Now, post Burkitt's death in 1993, numerous studies have since confirmed Burkitt's hypothesis. A 2019 British Medical Journal review on several systematic reviews and meta-analysis. This is where they pull together studies of the same type and make more significant conclusions. Found that eating more fibre reduced the risk of non-communicable disease and death across all-cause mortality. Which, for eating some more fruits and vegetables, yes, well, I'm not going to say any more. So there's a pretty clear case that this form of currency for your body makes a real difference. But the two primary forms of fiber, excuse me, contribute in their own way and point to one of the main reasons to have a diverse diet as well. And let's look at the one of those categories, which is soluble fiber. Now, soluble fiber has a prebiotic effect and can help nourish the large intestine. The soluble name comes from the fact that soluble fiber dissolves in water and it forms a gel when it does so. And you can find it in the inner parts of the plants you eat. So some of the primary sources of soluble fiber include fruits, oats, barley, legumes, peas, beans, vegetables such as broccoli and carrots and most root vegetables. Now this observation might be a personal opinion but I think that's partly why you're here. I think soluble fiber tends to have the most research to improve your health daily and in the long term. And this is what the this section of Free and Inspired Radio is all about, getting the best out of your diet. Now, Is My Diet Enough is about making sure that the food you're eating provides you with the resources to pay your body's bills. And aside from your micronutrients, such as your vitamins and minerals, having enough soluble fiber is crucial. And let's have a look at why. Soluble fiber can bind to cholesterol in the small intestine and prevent cholesterol from entering the body. This ability to bind to cholesterol gives soluble forms of fiber a cholesterol-lowering action that can contribute to preventing cardiovascular disease. A more detailed review of how soluble fiber can help with cholesterol levels had a consumption of a specific form of what they call viscous forming soluble fiber, reducing total and low density lipoprotein or LDL levels by around 5 to 10%. So if you look, let's, let's kind of put this into practical terms. So if your cholesterol, if your LDL levels came back with, let's say you're higher on the borderline category so let's say you're around 155 with your ldl levels depending on where you're having your blood measured that 10 percent change let's say you know, we'll go to the higher part of the parameter that 10 percent change would have your cholesterol ldl levels going down from around 155 you could say coming down to around about 140 which may actually push you from the borderline high category into either the lower part of the same category or the n- next category down, which obviously has you know a, a really positive trend line towards the longer term solutions around lowering your cholesterol. So this is really some pretty clear evidence here suggesting that fiber can definitely help with your uh, LDL levels. So other studies, including this one, also confirmed that the increased soluble fiber intake didn't affect high-density LDLs or, sorry, (laughs) high-density lipoproteins or HDL and triglyceride levels. So we're really only looking at soluble fiber and those LDL levels. And to be fair, 
the LDL levels are really where people need to concentrate on. So that's not all with soluble fiber. On the metabolic front, soluble fiber affects how your carbohydrates are absorbed, positively affecting your insulin response. Now, this positive effect on insulin occurs because soluble fiber creates a slower drip feed of the carbohydrates into the blood, meaning less insulin is required, stabilizing the blood sugar after eating. Now, this is something that could prevent slumps in energy, similar to that typical 3 p.m. slump that people can see after lunch. And if you are one of those people that get a 3 p.m. slump, go and check out that episode. I cannot remember the number of the episode now maybe four or five don't quote me go and check it out there's a full episode on getting rid of the three o'clock slump it's actually really easy sorry i get distracted building on this soluble fiber can help keep you full after eating and a clear bonus for weight management and portion control one study found that increased soluble fiber intake can reduce body fat and waist to hip ratio over one month the amount of soluble fiber used was around 1 to 20 grams daily, which is a considerable amount. So we'll keep listening and I'll give you some tips on how to get to that level. Now, after reading all that, would you believe that the proportion of soluble to insoluble fiber in fiber-containing foods is actually two-thirds in favor of insoluble fiber? So it is a little harder to get those soluble fiber levels up if you're concentrating on that, mainly because of that lesser proportion in foods. But we're going to kind of look into these things a little further for you. But before that, we're going to take a little bit of a break on Free and Inspire Radio. We'll be back with more, including the role that insoluble fiber plays for you. Fiber as a prebiotic, fiber for cancer, which is exciting. And finally, how to get started on increasing your fiber intake. All of this after the break on Free and Inspired Radio. We'll be back soon. Time to take a break. Are you enjoying this episode of Free and Inspired Radio? There's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty. If you want to connect with more free and inspired episodes, simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yes, yes. Welcome back to Free and Inspired Radio. This is episode 20. Thanks for sticking with us. In this episode, we're looking at fiber and getting a sense of how much benefit there can be to increasing your fiber intake if you're low from a dietary perspective. We've just looked at soluble fiber, so one form. Now it's time to take a look, time to take a look at the other type of fiber, which is the insoluble form. Insoluble fibers can help you maintain your metabolism and also promote a healthier bowel pattern. An easier way to think of sources of insoluble fiber is that it's basically just the outer skin of plants. So think skins of fruits from trees, such as apples, bananas, avocado, many vegetables such as zucchini, green beans, celery, whole grains, nuts and seeds. Insoluble fiber is best known for its ability to bulk the stool and speed up the transit time of food through the gut. These fibers can hold a large quantity of water and leading to a stool softening effect as well that can help people with constipation. Insoluble fiber also helps your metabolism along with soluble fiber depending, it seems, on the amount of fat in your diet. So this assistance comes down to how insoluble fiber influences something called metabolizable energy. Metabolizable energy is the total energy minus the energy lost in the stool, urine, and gases. So I'll repeat that. Metabolizable energy is the total energy minus the energy lost in the stool, urine, and gases. So another more well-known way of understanding this is energy in and energy out. This is slightly different, of course, from calories in and calories out. Now, we're far enough into this research to know there are nuances to this for weight management, but it's clear there is a significant connection primarily to weight gain. So not weight loss, but people actually gain weight when they're an imbalance is present with metabolizable energy. Insoluble fiber has improved metabolizable energy when when animals consume a high-fat diet. Now, 
we whilst this is in animals, we obviously always need to find out the how of this and make it confirmed in humans, so to speak. So just remember, animal studies are only indicative of potential, and insoluble fiber basically takes the energy out of the body. That's how it seems. In a way, it makes the energy indigestible and takes it with it and subsequently we see a decrease in energy that the body easy either uses or stores which you know for a weight management point of view seems like a good thing right let's pivot a little bit and talk about dietary fibers role as a prebiotic now in episode seven i think if you've listened to other episodes on nutrition's currency, I did a small section on dietary fiber and its prebiotic role. And I'm going to expand on this a little bit here. Now, in that episode, you may remember, I talked about a quote that it basically really explains a connection between dietary fiber and prebiotics. And that quote is, all prebiotics are dietary fiber, but not all dietary fiber is prebiotic. So I'll repeat that. All prebiotics are dietary fiber, but not all dietary fiber is prebiotic. Now, if you're new to the term prebiotic, a prebiotic as opposed to a probiotic is a selectively fermented ingredient that allows specific changes, both in the composition and activity in the gastrointestinal microflora that confers benefits. Now, the fundamental premise in this definition of soluble fiber as a prebiotic, for example, is that it's fermentable. So this fermentation allows the soluble fiber to contribute energy to the colon where the bulk of your probiotics are. Forms of soluble fiber contribute to increased levels of probiotics like bifidobacterium, but also create critical compounds called short-chain fatty acids, which can also be referred to as postbiotics in different contexts. Now, I could definitely do a whole episode on short-chain fatty acids, and I plan on it. I'll get there in time, but as they're so in, they're, it's so essential to get right for irritable bowel syndrome and other functional digestive disorders, I'd really love to do a deep dive on that. But as an introduction, for the sake of what we're talking about here, short-chain fatty acids can improve leaky gut, glucose and lipid metabolism, so glucose and fat metabolism, hence the cholesterol there, and regulate the immune system, inflammation, and blood pressure. It's a pretty common list of symptoms for a lot of people there, so these short-chain fatty acids are very important. For this reason, we're seeing prebiotic supplements becoming more popular in the -the over-the-counter market. Still, I would like to suggest that the only reason this market exists is that people aren't getting enough exposure to fiber in their diets. Hence the question here always, is my diet enough? And I would say in this case, and the case of soluble fiber and fiber in general, it's and its relation to your colonic and digestive health, your diet is enough. And I, I really want to try and make sure that I differentiate in some of these episodes where I think supplementation is important. But I think in this case, increasing your fiber intake in your diet is really just all you may need, and it's going to deliver some of those huge benefits. And this in this section now, listen to this, fiber and cancer. So it's not just the day-to-day kind of stuff that we're talking about here. We're actually talking about maybe reducing your risk of dying. So before we talk about fiber and cancer, there's a big caveat here. The results of the study around this still don't seem to be consistent enough. And remember, there are multiple different forms of cancer. So we can't just say fiber and cancer. We have to generally get a little bit more um, uh, specific in what we're talking about. I'm going to try and do that now. But obviously, please consult your medical practitioner, your healthcare practitioner before you're making decisions about these things. Because as I said, the research is kind of, you know, it's pretty cool. And there's, it's definitely going somewhere, but make it specific to you or specific to what your goals are first. So there are indications that fiber is associated with the risk, a reduced risk of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, gastric and endometrial cancer. Further, a higher fiber intake positively affects breast cancer risk with two meta-analyses showing an average of a 10% reduction in pre- and post-menopausal breast cancer risk for women with higher fiber intakes. This study found that soluble fiber 
was more significantly associated with better outcomes. But let's be honest, eating fruits, more fruits and vegetables is a small price for these types of results. But what if, as a proportion of my patients offer to me, people find it difficult with work and life to prepare and eat that higher higher amount of dietary fiber and this obstacle actually brings up an interesting conversation around the need to increase your fiber intake either via diet or supplementation because let's be honest there are a lot of supplements available there are numerous benefits to using fiber supplements mainly soluble fiber base for many conditions and once again as I said I'll be combining uh, doing another episode on top of that around the the compounds specifically that have the best ingredients because there are really just so many to choose from. There is a trade-off between improving your diet and using a supplemental form, however. The first is the cost. Adding more fruits and vegetables to to your diet, depending on where you live, will most likely prove to be more financially sustainable. Secondary, Secondary to that, supplements generally have isolated fractions of soluble fiber research to be a benefit. This specificity, of course, lends itself to a potentially better therapeutic result in a clinical outcome but not so much over time the reason why it's just simple wrapped up in that plant-based source of soluble fiber is all the other nutrition that goes with it including the insoluble fiber but also the vitamins and minerals now this won't be in the transcript so this is why you listen to the podcast but this is an extension of what natural medicine is and how i explain herbal medicine to people herbs you know medicinal herbs for example have hundreds of constituents within them and maybe two or three of them will prove to be the most biologically active amongst you know out of those hundreds so a good example of that would be cbd and thc and cannabis for example they're they're part of a hundred different phytocannabinoids but those two seem to be you know more biologically active than others you know turmeric is an example so curcumin is one of many curcuminoids that's biologically active so there's a an ongoing conversation in as to whether or not taking an isolated form for your health is beneficial as opposed to taking the whole plant or the whole fruit the whole vegetable as opposed to obviously isolating these ingredients in the case of what we're talking about today i would say that it's better to get the whole food because the soluble fiber is great what we're talking about is great but then why not just get more for your you know, more bang for your buck now there's always two sides to this discussion obviously and de- some definite context of course but for example i think it's always better to do something rather than nothing so if you find that you know cooking more doing more fruits and vegetables is is difficult or you're one of those people with the bitter taste gene where you feel like coriander tastes like soap yes that's real start where you feel comfortable that's really important if you decide to supplement with fiber definitely start low and go slow it's a very common term and people in in, interested in cbd will know that one but when introducing a high fiber content into your diet especially in the case of supplementation common symptoms can be gas distension and even slower bowels so it's essential to start the dose low and work up to more significant quantities once again especially in the case of that supplemental fiber also remember that some of the things we've discussed in this episode around insoluble fibers ability to draw water so this water drawing ability can lead to dehydration but also slower bowels so the message here is to increase your water intake alongside the increased dietary fiber content One of the best things about correcting macronutrient intake such as fiber is just the multifaceted benefits for your daily and long-term health. What do you think? Uh, I'm interested to know. If you want to leave some comments, please let me know. As we touched on earlier, this whole category of is my diet enough is a little bit removed from the brain and the gut kind of theme that we normally have with Freen and Scott Inspired Radio and it's more devoted to helping you find gaps in your diet where you might not be able to provide your body with enough resources to pay its bills. Short chain fatty acids for example produced by your fiber and take account for around 10% of your daily caloric requirements. So this percentage doesn't consider the other things that short chain fatty acids do around the body which once again is another episode entirely. Prescribing higher fiber consumption to a patient for me can sometimes, even though I know I the benefits of it, can just feel like a bit of a benign offering. 
But time and time again, I see the results over a shorter time than you might think. And in some cases with digestive conditions, it's just a fortnight where people come back and they feel vastly better. And I've seen that way too many times. So why not just assess how much fiber you're getting over three days and see how close you are to the recommended 30 grams a day. You might just connect with one of the most typical blind spots in the Western diet in 2022. So there you have it, episode 20 on fiber. I think I've broken the record for saying that word in around about 25 minutes. Maybe I'll contact Guinness and see if they can send me a certificate. But look, fiber and its role in the body is becoming a broader subject by the day, but hopefully this little introduction can help you. Before we finish this episode of Free and Inspire Radio, as always, if you would love to hear more from me and get the word on new articles, new podcasts, and more, jump over to the website, philipwatkins.health. I am steadily uploading everything. We're doing our best at the moment, but if you'd like to join our community, you're also welcome to sign up to the newsletter on the homepage or any of the pages on there with the articles. And soon enough, I will be in a little more regular touch with you around some of the new material that's coming out on the website. So your reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify help me get the word on the street. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, throw the video a like and subscribe to see when each new podcast is uploaded. I'd like to send a lot of some big shouts to people. Uh, some of the listeners of the show have gotten in contact this week. Again, it, this is what it's all about. The show is about helping you to find the freedom to feel inspired again. And I hope this episode gets you one step closer. Until next week, where we'll visit alcohol and everything you need to know about alcohol and your health. Take care of yourself and those around you. This is Philip Watkins signing off. Until next week, have a good one. Bye-bye. Oh my gosh, you made it to the end. This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.